the immigrants, they come here and they, they think, okay, I can do what I was doing back home right away. And that most of the time does not happen, mm -hmm. right? Most of us will have to start from the bottom up, like take one or two or three steps back. Right, right. And other people have to change careers. And it takes time to understand. So I started in staffing 17 years ago. I will not go back to my career. I have a marketing degree and I have a master's in organizational development. In Canada, the more years you add to your experience, you become an SME, right? As a job by an expert. And it's, you can make more just by adding years. Mm -hmm. In other countries, that does not happen. Welcome back to episode 15 of The Gathering Podcast. Once again, I'm Kasim Virgi here uh, at Startwell on King Street West in downtown Toronto. And for this episode, I'm joined in studio by Lorena Perry, who is a um, uh, cat. Well, I don't know. How would I describe your role at judge.com? I am the director of IT staffing, so mainly talent acquisition specialist. And let's paint the picture real quick of, of the company that you work with. Um, so what's the, they've been around the block. <laughs> yes, 52 years to be exact. So, so they are headquarters in the U.S. And we have more than 10,000 employees in the U.S. But in Canada, we're just a petite um, shop. Uh, we're six of us. And we focus in IT staffing. Um, we provide the, the whole support the whole process uh, with our clients from developing a job description to gathering the resumes, interviewing, qualifying, prepping them, and then submitting them to the client for them to select so who, you actually, whoever they want to hire. Yes. Uh, so do you guys, you build your own database essentially of candidates to put in front of the relevant opportunities that you represent as well? Yeah, we call it pipeline. So you are right. We have a humongous database because the business has been um, around for so long, right. and, and it's our own system. It's, it was developed by by Judge, and but that's not the only way we we gather people, right? So either you go and apply for a job, or you applied in the past, or you're now um, part of our database. But we also post in more than eight to ten different job boards, okay. and then we grab all those resumes too. We participate in a lot of network um, events with colleges and, um, and nonprofits. Mm -hmm. We put those resumes there too. And then the referrals, those are like kind of the best part, right? You place somebody in a job, they are happy with you and how you treated them, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road, hey, you know, my friend is looking for a job. Or you connect with them and say, hey, I'm looking for this type of person, and they refer you mm -hmm. people. So you really gather, um, or pipeline the candidates from very different sources. Uh, you were telling me just now before we got cracking that um, it's been 17 years in Canada that you've been 20 years. In 20 years in yes. Canada, and you've been in this space for 17 years, yes. was it? Yes. So what? What I know it's it's rewinding a long a long time ago, but what what framed your interest in working in this space? Well, I'm a people's person, and being in staffing, you have to be able to connect with both sides, right? The client and the candidate, and you do have to care. Um, but the way we started, and I think that comes to a lot of immigrants, mm -hmm. it was just an opportunity, right? My neighbor had a dog, I had a dog. We used to walk the dogs together and just chatting, you know, he said, you will be great in staffing because you connect with people, you need to find out what they're looking for, right? But you also need to sell them what the job is. So you need to find like the right balance uh, for that. And that's how I got my first job. That's also networking. I always tell yeah, people exactly, like in right. Canada is not what you know, but who you know. Who you know. And it's yes. a tough situation in Canada to, to rely on network because of how distributed our people are, you yes. know, across this massive country. Granted, we're all in cities, but even our city, like look at the GTA, six million plus people and so spread out, right? Um, so it can be difficult, especially, this is something that's that's come up in the series so far, is so many organizations are turning to hiring remotely because of the, the fact that like the talent pool has spread a little bit geographically yes. during the pandemic. Um, is, there, is that something that you guys are finding as well? 
Yes, but I call it the pendulum effect. The pendulum effect. Is that your original phrase or is that something I've heard somewhere before? That's me. That happens in life uh, through a lot of things, right? First, we go to one side. So when the pandemic started, you know, first everything shut down and then everything mm -hmm. went remote. Everybody was working remote. There was no really opportunities to go on site because things were not open. But right now, the things, you know, are cleaning up and the, the clients have their own buildings and they are paying for those spaces and they do see a difference or an advantage to be on site and face to face. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now they're pulling and say, okay, we want you back in office. And I have clients that maybe six months ago, they say one day in office. And now they're saying two, mm -hmm. and they're saying starting next year is going to be three. So they're really, so you know, the pendulum is right. is going back to the other side. But the candidates now, or the employees, because they've been remote for so long, and also proven, right? A lot of people, and I will say, eighty percent of people have proven that they can do their job remotely. Mm -hmm. Not everybody. Yeah, not everybody. Not, it's not for everybody, yeah. right? So, but now they're they're pulling. The pendulum goes this way, and. The clients are saying, no, we want you on site. And they say, no, we can do it remote. And so eventually it's going to settle at some settle. happy medium. Yes. But it would be a mix. It, definitely, 100%. It's never going to go back again to uh, fully on site because we have that um, capability of not doing it remotely, right? Before, we didn't have the laptops. We didn't have the internet access. All of that was slowly but surely being installed and, and settled for them to, to be productive and, and proven, right? I don't know if you remember two years ago, having um, Microsoft Teams or a Zoom interview was like, what? What is that? And you didn't want to do it. And, and when it was coming. Yeah, well, you tell and, me. You're the professional and in this now space. It's everything. Everything is via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or WebEx. So pre-pandemic, were you conducting your candidate triage an interview, first process interview kind of thing, like all in person, like everything was in person or telephone got replaced with video calls? How What changed? Oh, okay. So a lot of um, th over the phone, the more complex or the more senior the role was, we definitely will meet with people in person. And then that just went downhill, right? Mm -hmm. like, who wanted to meet with you? And they, they will say, no, she's crazy. Uh, so it got replaced uh, to video conferencing. Yes. And what have you seen from the client experience through that process? Has it changed the expectations of understanding a candidate? Like, are your clients that are the organizations that you're hiring for or helping place candidates for, are they finding it... Um, Maybe now it just feels like old hat, like there's been a couple of years now. But like, has it changed the way that they get to know the people that they bring into their organization without having that like FaceTime in person time? Yes. Um, and now because the pendulum is going back, they will say, OK, we'll do maybe the first and the second interview remotely over mm -hmm. the phone or video. But then they want the third one in person. Right. Right. Like I am not going to make an offer if I don't get to meet the people. And I do also work a lot of in the IT sector. Mm -hmm. And one of That's the like things- That's like software development or that is all encompassing? Everything. Okay. So help desk, as I support um, BAs, QAs, testers, uh, project managers, program managers, solutions architects, right? So, and of course, software developers from the end, back end, full stack. There's been abuse of, of having the capabilities of doing things remotely because sometimes it's not the same person doing the test because we do a lot of coding tests. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah. That's actually happened where someone's yes. like getting their friend to <laughs> like, so sad, but yes. wow. Yes. So, and then they show up for their like real interview at the end, the third interview and they're like, they don't know how to do anything. No, or they eventually get the job, mm. right? And because it's, it's remote. Um, a lot of the development roles could be remotely done, right? You don't need to be in office to be coding. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, two, three months down the road, they say, okay, he's not at that level. He's not capable of that. So now we got to the point that when they're doing the, the coding test, they need to prove who they are and show their ID and like a formal wow. ID, you know, a passport. Um, wow. And they, they could they, be anyone, even on camera. Yes. Or people that have been interviewing and they have like a, a pe like an ear uh, piece and somebody's telling them the Jeez. answers or they're cheating 
Big That's time. like cheating for an exam. They, they will be Except talking, but they're not talking. They're just moving their mouth and somebody else is answering. So there's been a lot, a lot of abuse. Yes. Um, that is super crazy. I understand maybe where that would come from in a sort of a, like a server farm, you know, like a, like a, like a, a what would you call it? Like a, a call center sort yes. of role. Oh, no. You know, just for <laughs> like if you were a customer support person who's very anonymized anyway, like I could see where that, that would happen. But if you're responsible for the work that you're putting in in the job, it's a bit short sighted to try and hack your way into the job because eventually it's you're going to let people down and get yeah. fired. Or what people believe is I will get to that point, but the client needs you to be at a certain level and not have to wait a year or two for you to get. Yeah. And like, in all honesty, I mean, that, that happens in general. So it might be worth talking about, you know, what's the finesse that you need or that you've developed to try and perceive where there's a match between uh, a role and a candidate? It's, it's, I always say it's like dating, you know, when, because we, we hire for contract roles and we hire for permanent roles. So a contract um, could be six months, 12 months two years, but you're in and then you're out and then you're done, right? Mm -hmm. A permanent role, hopefully, you know, you get to stay. Now the average is 2.5 years on permanent roles. 2.5. See, other people on this series have told us in, in um, for software devs, yes. especially with like, you know, well-funded VC-backed series D sort of companies, um, it's like six months. It's gone down to six months. For permanent roles? Yeah. Oh, okay. People are churning out. You know, un, sub like sub thirty five years old, so people between you know mid twenties to mid thirties, uh, but like rock star developer team lead people come in, solve a problem like a big problem, and then they're like, well, there's no more challenges, I'm gone. And apparently, with some of the clients that you know, some of our guests on the show have had, um, they're seeing that as a repeat process now. It's like a cultural thing, um, downtown Toronto, but. And I think the disadvantage there for the candidates is they don't know that they could be harming their future because the clients will see that, oh, they don't stay on a role. But mm -hmm. if they want to be a contractor, you know, do consulting for the longest term, then it's fine. Right. Right. But then don't want all the benefits that come along from being on a, on a permanent role. Are you seeing those lines blur between candidates thinking of a contract or a gig and a full-time job as synonymous? Yes. Yes, because for them, it's just give me the opportunity. I want the exposure. I want to learn. I want to experiment, right? Where the client hopes, no, this is a long-term, right? Right. Because I want to rely on you. I, I want gonna, you to build yes. capacity for my organization, teach other people, yes. grow in the role. Yeah, but going back to the, the dating um, yeah. analogy that I do. So if you want a contract for me, it's like dating, right? You you go there. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to get married, right? So it's just dating. You're going to be there for six months, for a year. You have to be nice, mm -hmm. and, and it's a good interaction. But if it works, maybe you get extended. But if it doesn't work, right? no harm done, you move on, right? And for a permanent, it's, it's a longer term because mm -hmm. they are maybe going to have a project that is three to five years. So if you leave halfway, you know, you'll leave them handy. And it's the same with the marriage, right? If you get married, you have kids, and then you go, hey, I'm done. Right. Hey, hello. Yeah, you know, thanks. We have this, that was fun. Yeah, we have uh, all these commitments. So when we interview candidates, it's very key that we connect with them, not only at the professional level, but a little bit more deeper to find out exactly where they add what want, what what they want like lifestyle values yeah so legally we are not allowed to ask you know your age and if you're married or um you know nothing personal you have to only focus on the experience and and you know if they need two weeks notice to start a new job and the Isn't location it? right like you you ask all those things but in my team i always say you know you have to connect with them you have to without you asking for those things, they had to open up and tell you, okay, I really need a permanent job because mm -hmm. this, right? I just got married, there's a baby coming on the way. Um, we have, like, this is Canada. We have, I'm an Im immigrant myself, so mm -hmm. we have a lot of people come from other countries. And if they're applying for the PR status, you get more points 
if you're working on a permanent role than right. if you're working on a contract, for example, right? So knowing those little things, it really helps you to connect with them and then go back and say, hey, this opportunity, it is for you. Or for this one, if you want to apply, yes, but I don't think it's aligned to what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And the same applies with the clients, right? The clients, they always, I always say, they want the unicorn, right? They oh, always right. want somebody that doesn't exist. Or the Frankenstein, I said, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit piece of this, a little bit of that, and that person does not exist. Uh, sometimes they're replacing somebody that left after 20 years, and they started probably, let's say, if he's um, testing for a software and then became QAs, and now they're, and now they're team leads. So they grew through through the years in mm-hmm. that role and now they can they can do everything but if i find somebody that is doing testing they have not managed people they're not doing the qa yet right so finding that replacement is very hard because that person really doesn't exist mm-hmm. they want the unicorn so it's also our job to go and try to find out with the client, where are they hurting? What are the things that they need immediately? Maybe that role, it should be two people and not one. Right. So we also become kind of like um, coaching. So you're, you're trying to keep things balanced. And I always say at the end of the day, it's not about making money. Yes, it is, but no, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we play somebody in a role and they are not... It doesn't work out, you have to replace them, right? Yes, but how can I sleep at night, right? I put you there and you're not happy. No, or with my client, if mm-hmm. they're not producing or they're not at the level they say they could, you're also oh, not for sure. delivering. So yeah. you have to keep that that balance. But then you have the great stories where you find somebody, they loved it, and then they eventually five, six years, they become managers and then come back to you and they say, hey, now I need to build my team. Can you help me, right? Do so. you think there's, there's a cultural disconnect the, from... You know, talking about kind of new immigrants and the PR and the need for people coming uh, to Canada to kind of like really settle and nest a little bit, get, you know, because there's so many other things. When you come from somewhere else to a new country, um, there's so many factors going on in your life that require this kind of, I need to figure stuff out. And to do that, I need some regularity, some schedule, some reliability in my life. Um is there a disconnect or, or a difference now emerging that's more obvious in the sectors that you handle um, between the willingness to commit to a career for new immigrants versus people that have like, you know, the second, third generation Canadians? I've certainly seen that in our hiring process. Um, we have higher churn amongst employees who of different roles, all different roles, um, who maybe are seeing that they have more options often cases they don't realize that like within the roles that we offer all those options exist you know yes we're kind of a hydra company so there's like whenever whatever job you're doing here and we take an entrepreneurial spirit so it's like whatever you want to do in your job if you see benefit to it for the organization it's like do it you know i'm not very we're not very micromanagerial um, and we're a lean team, so it's a different context compared to a corporate environment. But yeah, what do you, any thoughts on, on that? I think, um, and I'm an immigrant, so I'm a little bit biased. Right, yeah. Uh, we come here, we just want to work. The disconnect, I think, is that we don't understand as immigrants the Canadian market. Mm-hmm. which if you were already here in Canada, you know more about the networking and, you know, being on time and things that are very key mm-hmm. to to get a job. The immigrants, they come here and they, they think, okay, I can do what I was doing back home right away. And that most of the time does not happen, mm-hmm. right? And, and the resume needs to look different. Um, the networking is key, even volunteering. I remember when I came here for the first time and, and I said, volunteering, you want me to do what for free? <laughs> no. And I started volunteering 19 years ago and I still volunteer, even though I'm not looking for a job anymore. So there's that disconnect. Mm-hmm. With, with Canadians, maybe they are more... They have more knowledge of what to do and what not to do, but they definitely sometimes don't do enough research because they think, okay, I'm gonna interview, I'm gonna get the job. Mm-hmm. And they're not well prepared for the interview and, and for that point. So maybe that's where the disconnect is. Um, 
but everybody's different. You know? Yeah, every, it's, every it's tough case. To, yeah, it's tough to kind of generalize. Every case is different. I have people that came uh, from another country, and right now they are on a permanent job. They're only being here six months, and they're doing well. Mm -hmm. And other people have to change careers. Most of us will have to start from the bottom up, like take one or two or three steps back right, right. before you can get to the point. The difference with Canada and other countries is in Canada, we're specialists. Mm. And other countries, we're generalists. For example, in Mexico, we don't say generalists. We just say that we multitask. Right. Yeah, we can do everything and anything, and an employer will see that as an advantage. Mm -hmm. Here, it's like it, great. There's, there's there's so much that you can help with as yeah. opposed no, to here. They're afraid of you. You know, they're going to be bored. They're not going to last. They really don't know much um, of one thing. You know, they know a little bit of everything. So it's it's a big no no, and and it takes time to understand. So I started in staffing. 17 years ago, I will not go back to my career. I have a marketing degree and I have a master's in organizational development. Mm. I don't, that helps me on my job. Sure, it frames right? the work yes. that you do, yeah. I understand it better, but I don't want to be in a marketing, you know, right. creative company doing that because I've been doing this for 17 years and I know that in Canada, the more years you add to your experience, you can SME, right, as a job expert. And is you can make more just by adding years. Mm -hmm. In other countries, that does not happen. How is that going to change in the next decade, though? Do you think, with with this kind of like shorter commitment people have to specific jobs, companies, careers? If that you said two and a half yes. years, right? Yes. If churn is about, five. so, what does that mean a decade from now? Do you think to this culture of specialization, expertise, and advancement, uh, is that challenged? Yes, um, but, but they don't last. They only last that amount of time. But then they move to the same role somewhere else just mm. to make a little bit more money. Um, so they they are building that SME um, expertise. There'll be more people that will become independent. So I see, I've seen that now happening, but with people that already kind of settle, mm -hmm. right? That. The newcomers, they don't want to do, you know, their own business and being independent because they don't have that security first, right? It just goes to the pyramid of, right. of um, Maslow's hierarchies yeah. needs. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean, that's where I, I'm, you know, I'll call it out as a kind of entitlement. I see a lot of entitlement in kind of like multi, uh, in, in let's call it like Canadian born Canadians. Um, maybe it's this assumptive kind of flexibility with the system and, you know, knowing all the like, uh, opportunities available and then also you know having fallback if if you grew up here and uh, your parents are baby boomers the likelihood of you being able to quit your job and return home or ask dad for some money is higher yes. than if you came you know to Toronto with two thousand dollars and you have to make it work <laughs> yes. like you have to pay rent yeah like I remember when I moved to New York in 2005 I moved to New York with a thousand bucks I had to convince this employer I'd been Con, you know, conversing with over the internet that I was worth hiring. Um, they weren't going to get me a visa. I had to get a visa at the border. I was okay. a Canadian. So luckily I was in Kenya at the time. So it's kind of a crazy story, but I got a ticket. My dad bought me a ticket to New York via Toronto, stayed at a friend's house, took the bus through the route that I found was the easiest to get a TN visa to work in the States. Took, this is 2004, so just a few years after 9-11, which meant that the hiring climate was a bit iffy, visas and the border control was all tough. But made it through, got my visa at the border, because you get it literally at like this little hut next to the bus stop. Went to New York with no place to sleep. Um, walked into my interview, you know, the next day, because I stayed at some hostel last minute. Um it was all dressed up, right? Because I want to make a good impression. I'm wearing a suit. Yes. And everyone at this nonprofit that I was working with, they were like, who's that guy? Do we owe him money? Why is there a guy in a suit here? Because yes. they were all like wearing, you know, khakis yes. and, and it was it was casual. And uh, anyway, we became fast friends, uh, had a great session. They hired me. I came back to Toronto to kind of circle the wagons, get some old stuff that I had left back from university and then moved down in New York. And yeah, it was really interesting because I, I, I don't, 
I didn't have any fallbacks except for like my network and my network was music. So I remember I had like a big backpack. I was staying with a friend in Brooklyn uh, and I didn't have a place to stay. And so the first day at work, my idea was like, I'd go downtown, maybe stay in a hostel again and figure that out because the Brooklyn thing didn't work out. Classic immigrant story, right? So then I arrive to my first day of work with this massive backpack. There was a party that night uh, where someone I knew through the internet was DJing. And, um, and as soon as she saw my backpack at the gig, she was like, oh, okay, I get it. Go to this party. She writes down this address. <laughs> She's like, see my friend Tito. Yes. He's DJing. He'll hook you up. And I didn't quite get what she meant, but I showed up at that party and right away, you know, Tito was like, we became friends, we were DJing together. And he said, look, you could stay with me. And then, you know, I, I stayed on a friend's couch for like two weeks while I was looking for an apartment. Um, and but that's networking. Right? Yeah, and it's crazy, but I keep telling people, people in Canada who are, who, you know, are, are like me, like born in Canada, but maybe never left Canada and never left the city that they're from don't quite get these stories, you know, where I, I tell people like, then I got a paycheck, right, from this legitimate company I worked for. As a Canadian, you don't think about this stuff. But I get a paycheck and I think, okay, I've got a Canadian bank account. How am I going to deposit my, they wouldn't pay me into my Canadian bank account. So how am I going to deposit this? Well, I couldn't get a bank account with the timeline that I wanted. And I needed the money. So that first paycheck, I remember I went to the cash and loans on the corner and you know, in Harlem next to my house in the middle of the night, right? By the time I got home from work and I'm looking over my shoulder, walking home with my cash in my pocket. And I'm thinking, wow, this is quite an experience. This is something that like, of course, millions of people have every single day. But as a Canadian in America, it's something I never thought would, I didn't think that experience would be different. Uh, and it took me like three months to be able to get a bank account to legitimize myself. Um, so it is very interesting because I think the immigrant experience paints this uh, more colorful life of, you know, having to learn systems, but also implement um, a lot of resiliency or, or rely on resiliency oh, that's personal 100%. determination based. And so that I could see that coming back to this like job market thing as being for me such an asset. Like I, I want as an employer, anyone I hire to have you know, the ability to deal with change. Multitasking is a massive asset. <laughs> open eyes to I be have people able, for you. <laughs> yeah. Open eyes to be able to learn things as they come. Yes. And a pe pleasurable attitude um, amidst all of this. It's not like, oh, no, I'm suffering so much. It's more like, great, I can face challenges and I, I have confidence in myself. It's funny you're saying that um, through the pandemic, some of the volunteering that I do is going to nonprofits that are funded by the government to help mostly immigrants, but it's also people that have lost their jobs and they help them fix their resume, mm. prepping for an interview, even have English as a second language. And I volunteer between six to eight with the, um, corporations like that. But with the pandemic, they were not having these events, right? So now they're starting doing it via Zoom and they will have um, I will have um, meetings, you know, five minutes prepping people. Um, I will have um, talks just about what to do in the pandemic. And people were depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the newcomers, they just got here and the pandemic hit. You know, so how am I going to look for a job? And nobody is really hiring. So some of my talks were, were about that, that your attitude is key. So, okay, is sad out there, nobody is putting jobs, nobody's interviewing, nothing's moving, but that doesn't mean that you have to stop, mm -hmm. that you have to freeze and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna wait for, for this to be over, right? People are getting served, so at least they have some money to survive, but I said, no, 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 this is the time that you need to be more active Yeah, don't go ever. on neutral. No, yeah. but don't even go like first, you know, this is the time to go forth and it really uh, speed up, so f fix up your resume. Uh, go and have your social media up today, especially LinkedIn, right? If you don't have a good picture, now is the time. You have the time at mm -hmm. home to practice with your phone, and, and there's so many tricks for you to create your own, you know, kind of professional-looking picture and put it out there. Um, start connecting with people. Start seeing the companies that you want to work for. Maybe they're not hiring right now, but create alerts on Google. So by the time they hire, you know, you, you are already 
prepared for, for that to happen and not start right there. So keep doing that. And and the other beautiful thing is Canadians are nice people. So start connecting with them. Yeah. They, they were home. They were not commuting. They will connect. They will respond. Even if they don't have a job for you, they were all, at least connect. So by the time things open up, you already did all the pre-work, right? So attitude is key that you have that positive mentality in you saying, okay, things are dark now, but it's a pendulum. It Mm -hmm. has to come back, right? Yeah, and I think that's great advice, especially talking about this research function. Like people, often cases I see this is that a lot of candidates don't, because maybe they're so um, feeling like they're so desperate for employment, they're desperate, so they want to spray and pray, especially if they're applying themselves without without a recruiter helping them. They want to apply to everything they can as quick as they can. There's no depth of intent expressed to the potential employer. And for me, I'm like, I don't care if you just sent me a resume. I'm not going to look at a resume unless it's coming with some sort of extra expression of identity. Yeah. You know, And we, we mentioned this, but why LinkedIn is kind of interesting and important and also prepping your digital identity and making sure your digital footprint is clean, um, it's you are means of expressing who you are and what you're interested in in a way that the employer can find because like you said the employer you can't put in a resume and the employer can't ask you those questions legally so you have to prepare that information for them to find Um, I always say LinkedIn is not your resume it should not be your resume and it lets you be a little bit more expressive and and show a little bit of your personality right so for example in the subtitle people will will put their actual title at right, work. Right. Me is like, I love my job, or I'm the matchmaker, or I connect people. I, I change my title every three months, trying to show a little bit of, of my personality. And Some when you- Some humanity to it, right? Yes, and when you um, go to the profile part, I always put, I'm a passionate and blah, blah, blah. And I put passionate, so they see it mm-hmm. because if you don't want to hire somebody that is passionate, then don't hire me, right? Right. Yeah. I, I want to show it, and on a resume, you really can can show that, and then you can attach videos, and you can att- like I put my YouTube videos there. Mm-hmm. If I do volunteering, there was one time that I brought dogs from Mexico, Mexico, and I put you know pictures of that there. You cannot have that on on your resume. It, it doesn't show the whole spectrum of a person that you are, right? A resume is more. You brought dogs from Mexico. Yeah. To Canada to save them. Yes. So did Poncho, our producer. Poncho brought cats. If I, like, I, if I know the story correctly, he found cats in a dustbin. Someone yeah. had thrown out a litter, and so he and his wife brought these cats all the way back to Canada, and they raised them and saved them. Okay. No, this is a this is through a established organization. Oh, it's no. called the Doggo Project. These guys just brought They're some animals Mexico. a little under the radar. They have brought more than 2,000 dogs. Wow. Yeah, and find them homes. And then they have alliances with nonprofits here that they will receive them. They're, they're already vaccinated and fixed and all the paperwork. Like you have, you, you, they call you the um, flying parents. So it's just through the flight because they cannot come through an airplane if they're not assigned Accompanied to, yeah. by a traveler. It has to be, yeah. There's no yeah. dog planes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. They cannot travel by themselves, yeah. right? They cannot just put them there. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think the creative potential for employees or potential employees to express who they are is greater than ever on the internet. And and LinkedIn specifically, like we've been talking a lot on this series uh, with guests about how it's evolved in the last two, three years. LinkedIn changing its interface on the web oh, yes. to like kind of copycat the old Facebook interface and try and now really go with, like we publish a lot of video and clips even yeah. of this will be yeah. on. So it's really nice because people can quickly on LinkedIn, like as it's a social network, get this really deep feel for what you're interested in, what you can do. And who you know also, yes. flaunting the network. And I think this is an, a big point, and, and I love your thoughts on this, especially for new immigrant um, candidates, is how do you leverage your network where, when the convention or conventional knowledge here is to say your network doesn't exist anymore because it's in a foreign country? No. Um, 
Well, first of all, I recommend before you even come to start networking. I have people that connect with me and say, hey, I'm applying for a PR in Canada. I'll be there in six months and they send me an invite. Mm. And I do connect because I know they're coming, right? Um, so free work. Before you get here, start connecting. And then if you go, that's why networking is so key. So if you go to an event, now there's more events. Even if it's an online event and and you meet, you know, four or five people in Canada, right away, go and connect with them. Right, right. But mention, right? And then don't just send the invite. When I started, um, I think I've been on LinkedIn for 14 years, but my first invites, I had to write an explanation. Explain who am I? Yeah, yeah, and why do I want to connect with you for, for people to accept? Now, thank goodness, you know, my profile looks a little bit better, so if I send an invite, I get accepted. But you need to be able to say why you're connecting with them. Mm-hmm. And it's not to ask for a job. I always yeah. say networking is to work the net. And it's, it's not a job board. Yeah, it's so true. And it's all it's about social engineering. I mean, the early days of hacking back in the 90s, we used to say this phrase, social engineering. And I think that it's something that's fallen out of the vernacular of, of kind of internet culture. But it's something to bring back because it's really just about the, the concept of how do you use the tools at your disposal to affect the outcome that you want through social cues. Like LinkedIn is the best tool right now, I think to be able to put out an image that's, let's assume you want to be authentic, that's authentically expressive, but that can be channeled by your intent. So you say, okay, you want to set expectations when you add a a connection by saying specifically, explicitly, or otherwise, I'm not looking for a job, you know? Um, But replace that with value. So give value to the person you're connecting with, and now they're going to see you as a valuable connection even before they accept that connection. So no matter what that means, of course, content being king, podcasts are a great way to do that. Invite people to a podcast. Now they know you a bit better. Host an event or invite them to some sort of volunteer engagement that you're doing, and they see that you have a cultural depth to you. Um, Yeah, there's so many ways to play that. Yeah, but LinkedIn is not the only tool. Right. And I always say um, seven out of 10 jobs are not posted online. Mm-hmm. They're hired through word of mouth and referrals. Yes, it's the hidden market, right? So if you are only looking for a job online and you spend 10 hours a week all online, 100% of your time online, you're missing 70% of the jobs that are out there. Mm-hmm. So yes, go and connect and and try to have that communication, right? It's not just you, you send an email, then you send a follow-up. Then, um, like for me, at the beginning, I will say, hey, you know, you connected with me two, three months ago. If you don't mind, I would like to buy you a coffee. Can we meet for a coffee? And I connected with VPs and, and senior people 17 years ago when I was just starting and I would say, I just want to pick your brain and mm-hmm. learn a little bit of what your company does. Social and, engineering. You're expressing yes. the value too. It's like, I'll treat you to a coffee. And they're like, oh, who is this ballsy person that wants to talk to me? I don't know who this person yeah. is, but sure. And yes. Something fun to do. Yes. And surprisingly, a lot of people will say yes. And that's how you start connected. But then you have to find how to give back, right? So I, I can give you an example. When I started doing uh, pipelining for a particular client and I was connecting with, with certain type of um, engineers and I created my list and I will send them jobs here and there, once a month I will send an article that I did my own research mm-hmm. that I thought it was relevant for them. So, hey, oh, it's almost like a newsletter, right? So they will see that I was not just asking them to give me, mm-hmm. but I was able to give back. If um, if I were, will connect with other people and, you know, six months down the road, they will say, hey, my daughter is looking for a job. Yeah, I get she that a lot. She just graduated. Right? I get that a lot from one guy. <laughs> she just graduated. So I really don't have jobs for, for newly grads because the companies that hire us pay good money for us to find people. So it's sure. normally more senior or the unicorns, people hard to find. But I will still connect with that person for 10, 15 minutes, give them some advice. Mm-hmm. And then move on. So that 
um, contact sees that I'm giving back, mm -hmm. right? I'm not just asking him, give me referrals, or are you interested in this job? But when it says about his daughter, I will connect with her and try to help her and give him some guidance, right? That's why I created the YouTube channel because, okay, now I give you some tips, go and see the videos. Right. You know, most of the information is there. I'm a big fan of video. I think that video is such a cool, powerful tool. And now everyone in the palm of their hands can create a video with a, with a cell phone. Yes. So, well, even LinkedIn, you can right. put your videos now there. So and have lives too. Yeah, sorry? Have and they lives. have lives. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and the, the live, I really like the live audio format, you know, this whole idea of the kind of group call on LinkedIn. Yes. Like the fact that you can kind of like have a conversation with multiple people, uh, all logged into LinkedIn. I'm sick of video, like video calls. I love on-demand content, like to watch something when I have time yeah. to, especially if it's filmed in a way that's cinematic because then I'm, I'm engaged with the content. But um, but otherwise, I love phone calls. Like, I don't understand why everyone needs to suddenly... Uh, I think it's just a rush in the pandemic to jump on a video calls and be able to have a, you know, the... Be able to like audit who's actually in, in, intentfully listening by seeing their faces on some screen. But I love audio. You can relax. You can listen more. Conversations become richer, I think. Yes. Um, so that's a cool feature that I really like on LinkedIn. And again, another format people can host and invite people to, which is powerful because it's about connection. So if in connecting with someone new, you can connect them with someone, magic. Yes, yes. and that's the other thing that I think we try to do. If you connect with me and you're looking for a job and I know I don't have a job for you, I will say, hey, if you see anybody that is a second level connection through me on LinkedIn, right. I will kindly do a warm introduction. And you'll be surprised the people that did find a job that way. That's awesome. And have you ever had to do that second connection or connect someone with someone on LinkedIn and then you don't remember how you're connected with that person in the first place? That happens to me no. quite a bit. I, I try not to do and that. And I still, I still do the, I have a lot, because I don't know, I mean, maybe it's the business I'm in, because I'm meeting, you know, 100 people a day. Okay. Um, so a lot of people reach out and they're like, hey, yeah, we went to Startwell. We met, we saw Startwell. We were at Startwell and they add me. Yes. And so I, I, I accept everybody. And, uh, and yeah, it's awesome because then I get this rediscovery process because then yes. there's always someone saying like, connect me to Jim. And I'm like, Jim, Jim, interesting. Hey, Jim, you're up to cool stuff. <laughs> you know, like... So, uh, yeah. I have, I have people that I probably connected with them 10 years ago and found them a job 10 years ago, then didn't hear from them for eight years. And now they are ready to move or they have somebody that is looking for a job and they reconnect with me. But most of the time they will give me some background and say, hey, do you remember, you know, 10 years ago you found me this job? And See, so let's wrap this up by saying in the beginning you were talking about, I think, one of the great skills that, you have which kind of led you into this career was being a people person yes. right you have to care and with all these digital tools about you know network connections and the network effect enabling people to find work and companies to find candidates it almost feels like there's a new humanity emerging from the flexibility uh companies have in connecting with people um, for me, that means remote work enables you to find people uh, best in class anywhere in the world for what you're looking for and to be able to grow globally and all that stuff. Um, distributed workforce means that people can self-organize without needing um, central offices. So your infrastructure costs go down, but also um, you're empowering your teams to, to reorg based off of what they need to do and why they need to meet. Then things like LinkedIn double-edged sword maybe for employers in terms of people looking for other opportunities and stuff but otherwise massive opportunity for enabling employees to represent the company and be vocal about doing that so the way i'm looking at it it seems like you know as organizations hopefully become a little bit more trusting um with their employees and empowering their employees to uh, be vocal and be out there and represent online or otherwise um there's there's a new humanity emerging yes. in business and and i think also before if somebody would say you know i cannot make the interview because my you know somebody in my family is sick or because um 
something urgent came or people had to go back home, fly back home for a um, family emergency. Before it was it was harder for companies to to say okay well, he's canceling the interview or she's canceling the interview like and right. now there's more understanding I think we and we as talent acquisition specialists feel more comfortable sharing maybe not all the details because you also have to keep you know their sure. privacy but you can share more things you know this person is canceling or is moving the start date because of it so there's more transparency in the communications because now corporations are more humane in that sense that they will say, okay, you know, they they have their personal stuff, we understand, but we still want to proceed. We'll wait or we'll reschedule or we'll adapt to to those things. And I can give you just one simple example, and it happened just this morning. So we have one client that they want people on site because it's a customer service, so it's kind of like a call center, mm -hmm. and they train them there, and they have the supervisor there. If sure. something happens, you know, they... Um, They'd rather have somebody there. But I have a lady that just had a baby, and she has the right skills, beautiful communication skills. And she's local, but she says, I'm not ready mm -hmm. to go back on to, to work on site because my baby is two, three months. So I want for the first year, work remote, and then eventually work part-time remote, so hybrid. Mm -hmm. And maybe in two, three years, I'm willing to go um, on site. Before, I wouldn't even... Submit, you right. know, two three years You're ago. Like, this I was is like, a red flag. Yeah, she she said no, but I said, you know what? Let me call the client. I explained everything, and they said, oh, let's interview. Right. So that's great. Yeah, you're pushing the envelope a little bit, but you know that they have now that sense of okay, we need to see um, the employees as a whole, as humans, and, and, right. and that's key. And empower them to be able to self direct and work within their means and trust that. Well, part of that also is I think organizations are le leaning or learning to deal with churn. So it's kind of like a micro investment that they can make is to say, okay, well, if this person needs this, let me give it to them because the alternative is we don't have someone doing that job for six months or three months and that's more expensive to us, you know, so let's try it out. And oh, I can give you other example. We had a hire of a very senior software developer, but he's in Edmonton. And they also want them on site because now the role is hybrid. Mm -hmm. So he was going to move from Edmonton to Toronto. Wow. And the hiring manager says, you know, let's wait the first three months because in three months he doesn't perform, he's not going to stay. So don't make him move. <laughs> if he's not going to stay. So mm -hmm. let, let him start, see how things work out, and then we'll do the move. Or he can move, um, you know, after the probation, because everybody goes to a probation, right? No, I think that's smart. I mean, I, I've seen the counterbalance historically, and it doesn't make sense. Like, I was at a software company not crazy long ago, recent memory, uh, in the last decade, and the CEO was this crazy megalomaniac I don't know, control freak, but he was trying to push an update, you know, to, and there was this big scrum to develop the software. And he got the lead dev, uh, a hotel room or Airbnb across the road from the office so that he could just like sleep there. And he gave him like a spending account. He's like, don't bring your family down, but don't go home for two weeks. Just like scrum this out. I'll give you a bonus, sleep across the road, okay. and work like 18-hour days. And I'm like, that's not healthy for anyone involved in this situation. And how long can you do it for? Yeah, you're going to burn this guy out. And then what? And then all the innovations that he's created are probably not going to be able to be like borne by the rest of the staff. And you've put him on a pedestal above the other staff, in a sense, who could collaboratively solve the same problems together if their communication was tight and they were working together better with better leadership. And it was it was a real stickly point. I just didn't understand that. I thought that was like 50-year-old thinking, you know, like not relevant for today. No, I think flexibility and empowering people to make their own decisions is the way of the future. And organizations just need to develop their EI to be able to understand how to enable their people. And then how to communicate with them to, to watch for red flags, burnout issues, 
um, any other lifestyle factors that the job's not enabling people to to stay happy with. And training. Mm-hmm. I always tell that to my clients. You know, don't don't hire skills, hire personality. Right? If they have some of the skills and you can train them, you cannot teach the personality or the attitude. That's way harder. Hire the passion. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Arana, it was it was a pleasure chatting. Thank you. It was thank awesome you. having you on the series, um, and I hope we get uh, the chance to chat more as we approach our conference date in April. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure.